went through an experience that could have nearly taken my life away or definitely left me paralyzed from the waist down and I would have been sitting in front of you all tonight in a wheelchair. So tonight I'd like to share with you guys two experiences that I went through that in a flash definitely almost took everything away and the realizations that I've had from there. So the first is from my figure skating career. I used to be an ice skater from the time I was 6 till 18 years old. For my mom, I'm sure skating was such a great relief because I was one of those hyperactive children that could hardly sit for more than, I don't know, she would say five seconds at a time. So skating provided an outlet for my endless energy and I slowly fell in love with the sport and went from skating once a week to training eight hours a day, six days a week for almost 350 days a year. My whole world revolved around figure skating. From the moment I would spring out of bed for an early ice session to the time I would collapse after a gym workout at night, it was all skating. I was homeschooled in high school to be able to travel for competitions and you know, basically spent 12 years of my life creating this whole world. My identity was an ice skater. The final year of my career that I felt like, you know, the grand plan was coming together, I was speaking to the Argentine Federation and they were going to let me represent Argentina at the 2014 Olympics. So I started fantasizing with, you know, holding the Argentine flag at the opening ceremonies and I would, I would like stand in front of the mirror and pretend that I was accepting a medal. Um, so I really built it up and it was my passion. And then the final year I landed the hardest triple jump in a competition where there was so much pressure. There was a panel of 10 judges with a computer screen and they could analyze you know, every fraction of a frame of your moves. So that was huge for me to be able to land that triple. All I had to do was get a dual citizenship and the whole Argentina thing was in the bag and then I tore all of the ligaments in my right ankle, all the ones wrapping around and it was my landing foot on my right foot so whenever I would do a jump I was always pounding and landing on that leg and I still remember when I was with the ankle specialist they told me yeah that I would be off the ice for almost a year and in that instant I could see that whole world that I had carefully fostered and created it just completely shattered and in part also my identity kind of started crumbling because I knew that I wasn't just a figure skater but I think isn't it very easy to identify with whatever you do, whether it's your career, your business, your relationship, I'm a mother, a daughter, a sister. So in that moment, I felt that my identity as an ice skater collapsed and I kind of spiraled into an identity crisis. So at 18, for the first time I had to face who was I beyond what I did. Now, I was raised within a bhakti yoga family my parents were kind of like yogis and they would go to india and i was surrounded by this philosophy that we're not these bodies we're like droplets of consciousness within a material body we're spiritual beings having a material experience so for me it was now time to apply all of that philosophy that i had been raised with and easier said than done you know i felt very empty and hollow without something that once consumed every single day for me. So I had to really try and detach myself from the pain that I was going through. Of course I grieved and let myself feel it, but I had to try to think what is the lesson I can learn from this? Why am I going through this? So has anyone here, raise your hand if you've gone through like an identity crisis or everything you invested your time into was taken away? Yes, yeah, so I think it's something very universal that we can all relate to. So, what is transcendental knowledge, you might ask? So the yoga texts that we sell out there are filled with this knowledge that we're not these bodies. These bodies are like coats that you put on and take off. And it kind of answers the questions, what are we doing here in this temporal world that everything that's based on the senses has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So, this transcendental knowledge is not that it'll take the pain away, we're still going to go through painful situations, but it definitely minimizes the suffering because pain is definitely going to happen, but suffering is optional. So, it's kind of like when you break up with someone, you know? I remember the first 
breakup that I ever went through. It took, I was wallowing in my own misery. Why did this have to happen to me? Raise your hand if you've gone through a terrible breakup, right? <laughs> so with the transcendental knowledge, it definitely, then you can apply it to these situations that inevitably will arise, and you're not thrashed around with these waves of pain. You can, you can stay afloat. You're not drowning because you know that we're, we're just passengers in this world. It gives you a little bit of, of perspective. But in order to realize this transcendental knowledge and not just have it be dormant material that we read in a book and it goes in one ear and out the other, we must have some form of spiritual practice. The knowledge is kind of like the seed and the spiritual practice is like the water that you slowly go building your little seed of spiritual knowledge. And here, for example, we chant these mantras, you know, that allow us to tap into our highest self and connect to that love that's deeply within us, that we're all connected in that way. So this transcendental knowledge brings this, uh, or the spiritual practice brings the transcendental knowledge to life. Um, and that's what I had to do then with my skating career. It's kind of like, you know, if you try and explain, have you ever tried to explain love to someone? what falling in love feels like to someone who's never gone through it. It's something that maybe someone can rationally understand, like, okay, well, that sounds like a nice fantasy, but until you really, it happens to you and you fall in love and, you know, the sky becomes bluer and you see birds chirping, then you really feel it. So whatever spiritual practice you have and whatever form of meditation you do, it does bring that spiritual, the transcendental knowledge to life. So. It's kind of like, you know, if you try to give a plant pizza and pasta and feed it in that way, it's not going to be nourished. So in addition, a spiritual practice based in a deep transcendental knowledge, it nourishes your soul. Don't we all feel good after leaving here and chanting the mantras? We feel enlivened. Um, so yeah, it definitely brings it to life. So after my skating career, I definitely had to try to apply this knowledge and not get pummeled by the waves of my existential crisis that 18 year old me was going through. And this brings me to my second situation that I went through in life. Uh, I don't know if you guys noticed I'm wearing a brace now. Uh, this isn't a fashion statement. <laughs> um, we were, I don't know if you guys heard, but some of the Mantra House crew and I, 12 of us, uh, all friends, we were going to see the Poppy Flower Super Bloom and we were in a really bad car accident. Raise your hand, those of you here that were in the accident. I can see some of you. No, you were, you were not there. <laughs> um, yeah, so we were in a car accident that the police even said it's a miracle we didn't die in that crash. So we were all going to see the super bloom. We were in the desert in the middle of nowhere, laughing, talking, enjoying ourselves, and we were going down this way. We all looked to the right a few seconds in order to see this Mini Cooper that just completely ran their stop sign going over 60 miles an hour and crashed into our van and sent us not only spinning but it flipped several times. And I was sitting in the middle aisle and I ended up landing in the trunk. So every time it would flip, I was being like bashed around, kind of like a uh, rag doll being thrown around in the hands of destiny. I felt completely helpless in that moment. And Generally in life, we like to feel in control, we know what's happening, and I still remember that moment. It, it, it went in slow motion almost. I could see the horizon flipping and everything flowing or flying around me, and I landed on top of this drum in the trunk, and it looked like a war zone. There was glass, debris everywhere, and there was this body sprawled at my feet. I didn't know who it belonged to, but I heard a muffled, help, help, and I bent down and lifted this backpack off of one of my friend's faces, which was covered with blood. And as I sat up, I realized, oh my God, something is really wrong with my back. And I dropped the backpack and asked for help. Anyways, they ended up pulling me out of the back window because the trunk wouldn't open. And from there, the whole process started. They were trying to jab an IV in my arm. They weren't finding the vein and they moved me from one stretcher to another and took me in the helicopter to the hospital. Um, that was definitely a time that I had to rely so much on this knowledge that, okay, why is this happening right now? When during the helicopter ride, I was lying on the metal surface and it was bouncing. And I felt in so much pain 
but I just closed my eyes and tried to chant this mantra up here to try to find some source of peace <laughs> through amidst the suffering. Because a little transcendental knowledge that we practice and becomes realized takes you a long way. So whatever water you put to your plant makes a big difference in tragic situations like this. And when I got to the hospital, it felt like one of those scenes that I've only seen in a movie where they were running through the halls, people were running back and forth, and I felt totally bewildered. Anyone that crossed my path, I was asking them, do you know if I'll ever be able to walk again? I was in complete anxiety. Uh, and they shoved me into the trauma center and started running all these scans and tests, and it turned out that I shattered three of the vertebras along my lumbar spine, and it was compressed, and a bone was pushing back, touching the canal where the nerves are. So it's a miracle that it didn't push further and completely paralyze me for life. And I still remember, I was completely reliant on them because I couldn't even use the bathroom on my own. After several hours, I felt like my bladder was exploding and they shoved me over and put me on a thick bedpan which was excruciating and I was sprawled there in a gown and people running back and forth and like, just relax. And I was trying to, and I was like, I guess I'm a little pee shy. Did I forget how to use the bathroom after 25 years? Um, and they ended up having to put in a catheter, which remained the entire time. And you know, from there I could go into so many more details, but basically one thing led to another, and there was problems because the narcotics caused constipation, and I had gases that I couldn't even use the bathroom because from here down was all shattered. So uh, I still remember one night at three in the morning, I woke up from the pain and they did an ultrasound and they said, no, you don't have to use the bathroom. And turns out that that was when we first realized about the gases and I started throwing up from the nausea of the gases. And you know, you clench everything when you throw up and I was shrieking with pain. It was basically the worst uh, two weeks of my entire life. It's the most pain I've ever experienced. Preparing me for childbirth, and she's like, no, 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 what you're going through is much worse because you don't have a cute baby to look forward to holding in your arms. So I was like, thanks, lady. It makes me feel so much better. Um, anyways, but the two things that I tried to take away, or many lessons can be taken away, but two that I'd like to share from this experience is, first of all, not to take anything for granted, because Life is so fleeting, and anything can happen at any moment. I never even thought of how lucky I am to be able to use the bathroom on my own. But definitely after the crash, every time I sat on the toilet, I was like, wow, I, it's a miracle, the human body. So everything, really, to see it as a miracle. <laughs> because no moment is ordinary, you know? Everything is leading you somewhere. So that's number one, not to take anything for granted, whether it's your physical health, your mental health, your relationships, the people in your life. It's so easy to just go through our lives unaware of so much, how much we truly have. So one practice is that you can try is every night when you lie down before going to bed, try to list three things that you're just grateful for. Even as simple as today, I got out of bed and I was able to breathe well. It can be as basic as that. So try to do that to cultivate gratitude. The other thing, the other lesson that I took away from this terrible car crash is that everything happens for a reason. And if we try to transform seeing everything as a lesson instead of how easy is it to feel like the victim of situations. Why did this happen to me? The world's against me. I mean, am I the only one that does that? Or? <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> So it was, I mean, and it's hard. There was definitely moments in the hospital where I felt like I started lamenting a little bit about my condition. You know, I used to be an athlete and was very, uh, always intense and active and going outside and I was put into a position where I couldn't, I could hardly move on my own. At night, you know, when you sometimes roll over to find a little relief, I had to have the nurses come in and kind of roll the, the blankets underneath me so I could just kind of wiggle a little bit and that was my relief for the night. So. I definitely tried to see this as a lesson. In what way can I grow? Why is this happening to me? One of our teachers, Radhna Swami, has this beautiful metaphor of castles in the sand. He describes that all of us try to build these castles with our businesses, our careers, our relationships, 
And in the distance, we can see the wave of time slowly approaching and getting closer. So we try and build dams around the castle to protect everything that we put all of our energy and time into cultivating. And the wave of a time will inevitably wash everything that we've built in this material temporal realm that's based on the senses. So this really urges us to cultivate a deep spiritual side that will be everlasting, which is what I'm assuming the reason you are all here today the very fact that you're all sitting here is a little indicative of, of you guys and your depth and your level of spirituality. So, castles in the sand, it doesn't mean we're not going to build them, but it really means take the time to cultivate something internal and not just external, like giving pizza to that plant. Which reminds me of this philosopher, Tolstoy. He was such a renowned philosopher and had everything in life you could imagine, a beautiful house, a family, everything, riches, a great career. He was one of the better known philosophers of his time. But towards the end of his life, he started going through a existential crisis because despite having all of these possessions, he was still not happy. So he wrote this book, A Confession. And the book starts off with this Eastern fable where this monster throws this man into a well. At the bottom of the well, there's a dragon. And at the top, the man grabs onto this branch for his dear life. And at the top, there's two little mice gnawing on the branch. One's black and one's white. So it represents night and day and the inevitable passage of time. The man is offered two drops of honey, which for Tolstoy represented his love for his family and for his writing. And Tolstoy described that despite being offered this honey, it did no longer tasted sweet to him because he knew death was inevitable and it was going to happen. Now, for some of us, we all know death is gonna happen, but that doesn't take away from us enjoying this world because we almost, it's very easy to live in a reality where we think we're invincible. Ah, that's not gonna happen to me. Death, eh, that's, that's an old people thing. But, <laughs> but Tolstoy became essentially depressed. So this urged him to try to seek what creates everlasting happiness and fulfillment, if not everything that I have here. And he observed people who had a way of simplistic living, but elevated and high thinking. So despite these people he observed were building their castles in the sand, they were also cultivating that deep spiritual side. And he describes in this whole book, which if you're interested to read is a great one, he describes that when the people take the time to cultivate that everlasting spiritual side, and see their whole life as a giant meditation or a spiritual journey, then that switched for him and his existential crisis subsided and he was able to find more meaning in his life. One moment. So of course, we're of this world doesn't mean that after this talk you're all going to renounce everything and move to the Himalayas and become monks. So we're gonna build the castles we're going to develop the businesses and engage in relationships and have families one day, and that's beautiful. But in addition to doing that, cultivating that spiritual side where you're not then drowning in the waves of material existence because we know there's something greater. And it's not like if I'm broken up with, that's the end of the world and that's the only source of happiness. You're trying to cultivate that side within yourself that's everlasting. Because when we can see everything through those spiritual lenses, whether you break your back or tear your ligaments, it's all meant for our own growth, then that's when the real adventure begins. Because material life really is exciting, but it's, it's all the same, you know? We go to work, we have jobs, we wake up, make our tea or whatever, and, and every single day feels like the same routine. But the second you start seeing everything as a a miracle that starts happening to propel you on your own journey of growth and self-discovery, then everything becomes exciting and and amazing. Spiritual life really is amazing. I mean, how do you guys, don't you guys all feel really when you take the time for yourself to whether it's meditate or do exercise or something that you feel taps with your internals, you feel good afterwards. So spiritual life, as you can see yourself progressing down that path, it becomes exciting and ever-changing. Um, 
And now I'd actually like to shift the attention to you guys. And if anyone would like to share maybe a hardship that you went through, whether it was an existential crisis or a breakup or something like that, and how you coped and got over that, I would love for a few of you to share a little bit. So raise your hand if you'd like to. Yes. So my thing is like when I was young, I thought money can give happiness. Right. So at the age of 40, I bought a single family house in India. And uh, it is a very good thing in my life. And after that, I said, with one house, I got so much of security. So if I have more houses, I would be more happy and more financially. <laughs> right. So what I did is I sent a lot of money to India. Mm. And my, I, my dad at the time, what he did is he did some bad investment and all the money was gone. At the age of 30. And, uh, like why, why, why it happened to me? My dad, he's, he, has, he wants to multiply the investment, but unfortunately he just did a wrong investment and he lost everything. And, and I, I was so depressed and oh. after that I realized. And luckily God gave me all the money back. Hmm. But I got into yoga, health and all those things, but you know, like, that was my learning. Like, <coughs> if I didn't lose that money, I wouldn't get into yoga, exercise, right. I used to eat four pie, four large pie. <laughs> <laughs> I used to use a pizza as a, a depression. <laughs> so luckily, God put me in yoga and all those things, you know, health, and finally I came here because of that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Wow, very nice. So yeah, ultimately losing it happens for a reason. Thank you for sharing. Would anyone else like to share a hardship and how you coped with that? Don't be shy or raise your hands all at once. Yes. Uh, when I was 18, I was in an earthquake. And oh, we, wow. It was, we had to move out of our, our apartment was destroyed. And like my best friend moved to Wisconsin because of it was like it changed my whole life. Right. Um, and I had heard of Krishna before, mm. but after that, I was like, wow, the mind, everything could be taken away in one second. Right. Um, and and so that's when I started really reading the Krishna books and actually started chanting. So right. that was like the only permanent thing that I could have in my life because no matter what, right. no one can take away like chanting and meditation. Right. It's sometimes that pain that becomes a catalyst for change and propels you into a deeper journey of self-discovery. So that, that's beautiful because you see it then, everything becomes a blessing instead of a curse. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? Yes, in the back. Um, as a college senior, kind of currently in an existential crisis. <laughs> um, but coming here weekly over the past few months has been really healing. Mm. And I mean, I don't think without like all the anxiety in my life, I don't think it would have propelled me to even like, consider anything like this. Right. So. Well, thank you. That kind of reminded me of when one of my best friends, many years ago, she was going through her first existential <laughs> crisis and she called me and everything was a problem and she was seeing the world in, like as if everything was great. I remember telling her, I was like, this is great. That means now you're going to really propel into your spiritual journey. And at that time, she was like, yes, this is great. I'm so happy. <laughs> but now she looks back on that really difficult time in her life, and she's so happy that it even happened because now she's meditating all the time, and she's so peaceful. And granted, we're still going to go through difficult situations, but it really allows you a deeper sense of happiness than temporary little fleeting moments of happiness. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? One more person. Yes. Oh, a few more. We can do a few more. Yes. Uh, it's, uh, the, uh, there was a time when the, the people just started like leaving, uh, like the relationship been building for the, for the years. They, they slowly started like falling apart. Like friends come and go. Love, like what is actually love? Like in the beginning yeah. there was love. And then later, like, where is that all that gone? Right. And uh, you really like tap into that. I, I started like thinking about it. What is that love? And uh, just l learned that some of the realizations came that the the love of like you you follow kind of the society, what right. like uh, what what love actually is for the like common consciousness in the society we live in. Like people presented as as like very. 
uh, something tangible, something you can like actually, you know, like touch and like feel. But I learned that uh, that's only like lo like short term infatuation. But actually, the long lasting love is is very subtle and uh, based on like doing something for the like for the person, the action, like the service you take, like. Um, to do to develop to cultivate that relations right. rather than like in the Western world we think it's physical it's it's a right. lot like based on a bodily cut like uh, bodily relations so that's the thing of like learned being mm -hmm. in that like situation in life mm, well that's a beautiful realization to have had from people you love and friends falling apart yeah. It's funny that when you're open to it and when you don't resist change, you'll see that you're being pushed into a direction that will help you grow with people and situations that are ultimately meant for your growth. So if you can take it in the way that you have, then you're going to evolve into such a, into maybe a better form of yourself and a higher form of yourself. I saw a few more hands. Yes. So I was going to share this. All through my life, uh, I always had like uh, heartbreaks. I've never oh. really had um, like a relationship that I could really like, you know, be like, you know, feel, feel in love and right. like, happy. And so I kind of like re resign to the fact that it's my karma. Mm. That, you know, I, I, I was like thinking that, you know, maybe in the next life and I can, you know, be happy. Right. So I, but, but then. I, I always read like you know self help books and then a lot of the authors have always like re referred to reference to like the autobiography of the yogi of the yogi by Yogananda pra pra Paramahansa. Mm -hmm. So I think m most of you are um, um, like if most of you know about that book, right? Yeah, so love one, that book. yeah. <laughs> so that's the only book that uh, Steve Jobs ha had on his uh, iPhone. Right? Anyway, so one day I was in. The, uh, so I kind of like, you know, felt like, you know, because I'm already 50 next year and so I was like, I don't know if there's hope for love, like, you know, I just had a heartbreak, like, you know, like recently I said, what's going on? All my family's like laughing at me, what's going on with you? Like, oh. Yeah, it's like, because I'm Asian, so we're like, you know, supposed to be like, you know, family oriented, you should have like gotten married and be happy kids when you were 20 and you're 15. Anyways, so one day I was like, <laughs> it's the Asian shit that I had to like, you know, go through. Right? So, anyway, so one day I was like, you know, at the promenade, I, I was like, you know, I, I was holding this book, the autobiography of the yogi, right? Right. And then, and then as I walked out of that store in, at the promenade, Vijaya, the monk, our monk here, was selling the books out like you know the book that we have the text that we have out right, there right. and I was like wait wait a minute so I was like drawn to that table and I was like what are you what are you selling and then I just read the Bhagavad Gita with the Wayne, Dr. Wayne Dyer bless his soul and, and it's there in the book and I was like what is this like you know how could this be so I, I, I ended up like buying two two of the texts and then I started reading again and then at the um, at the um, autobiography of the yogi. I, I wanted the youngsters to hear this because some of you <laughs> might, you know, relate to this. Right. It said there, it said there, but so Vijaya invited me to the mantra house. It was Wednesday, so I was so excited, right? I'm, I'm Catholic, but I was like, fuck that shit. Like, I want to <laughs> like a scene in my like you know religion but but at this point <laughs> like, I don't have to, I don't really care anymore right? Right, right, right and then so as I was like reading the, the book again it said there at the in the book autobiography the yogi that no matter how karmic your freaking life is like you know you just have to like you know chant Hare Krishna and then there's gonna be like a shift so right, right. the karma is going to be erased. You just, you know, focus on, on the divine. And then just, you know, keep chanting the Hare Krishna. And then I said, like, Hare Krishna, I don't know. I, I don't think I know about this. And then the next day, the story, we cut the story short. Long story short. So I came here and then I stepped in here. I was like, Hare Krishna. I, I, I said, I saw this. And then the, the, you guys have, you know, started chanting. I said, I felt like, you know, I was home and then 
even if I close my eyes, I was like chanting already. So I really felt relieved and, and be, like, you know, the breakup, right? Just recently, right. like two months ago. And then I was here, so I kind of feel like there's like, you know, uh, calmness, whereas before I was like suicidal, something mm -hmm. like that, right? So now it's like sort of calmness, like, you know, like, you know, so surrender and everything. And life is beautiful. Like I always, I'm always in the state of gratitude. So wow. everything that you said, I relate it to that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Maybe you were the luckiest one of your family because if pain is the catalyst for change, you've had a lot of change and it brought you here. So thank you. How much time do we have left? I don't even know the time. Okay, it's, it's, okay, it's time. Well, thank you guys so much for listening.